today in studio with the Admiral. Bill, I've been stung again this morning, Stubblefield. <laughs> Former delegate John Doyle, who has not been stung. Go ahead, Doug. That is correct. No, I was going to say, I, I wear it as a badge of honor, Rob. <laughs> Uh, you should have seen. Is me that how you wear it? <laughs> yeah, you should have seen me running for the house yesterday. Said, Bonnie, Bonnie, bring the Benadryl, bring the ice. I've been a victim once again. I was sad to see yesterday, John, that the gasoline price wars on uh, Route 45 on the way into uh, Shepherd University came to an end yesterday when Sheets raised their price. Uh, but however, the 7-Eleven is still stated 3.349 as of yesterday. I don't know if they raised it. Uh, it was still that way this morning when I went by there. Yeah, it was. It's uh, it was kind of interesting to watch that happen as a couple of weeks uh, have gone by. With uh, 7-Eleven was under construction for two months, so when they came back on, they lowered their price to 3.349. While rocks and the sheets were still in the 350s, and then they got wind of it a couple of days later and dropped their prices to 3.3. Three nine, one cent below Seven Eleven. Yes, <laughs> and then yesterday I drove by the Seven Eleven, and the sheets was back up into the three fifties. So uh, the war was nice while it lasted, but Seven Eleven hasn't bumped back up yet. No, they haven't. And yeah, they lost a whole ton of business uh, while they were under construction. And the large part of the problem is. They didn't just lose their gasoline business. The construction was uh, so, uh, the, the, the area that was marked off was so big yeah. that a whole lot of people thought the whole thing was closed. So they, they lost their convenience store, much of their convenience store business as well. And so they're just trying to get it back. Mm -hmm. In studio with us, Delegate Mike Height back from Interims. Good morning, Mike. Good morning, Robert. Good to be here. Uh, that t shirt you're sporting, I understand. Uh, Corey Roman yesterday was. Is it every that time was, the that Cowboys? Was Monday, same T-shirt. It was the same T-shirt. It was Monday, <laughs> and, and that's why I wore it. I, Corey gave me a shout shout out on Monday, so I decided to uh, reciprocate and and give Corey a shout out. Thank you, Corey Roman, for recognizing the greatness of the Dallas Cowboys. <laughs> Oh, please. <laughs> Every time the Cowboys win, you guys wear your shirts. It's This is our year, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, every every year is your year since 1995, right? That's well, it ain't, it ain't going to be the New York Jets year. That's for uh, darn sure. Yeah, sure. <laughs> and, and, and that's who we have next week. So I, I expect another uh, uh, romping of, of the New York team that, that they got this past week. Hey, what did you accomplish while you were in Charleston? Um, you know, that's always a good question when it comes to interims. What do you really accomplish? A lot of times during interims, um, you're, you're doing a lot of things to prep for the next session. Um, and a lot of times it's, it's seeing or, or sitting through uh, presentations by different departments. Um, and that's essentially what was going on this particular um, interim. Uh, I'm on health and finance, uh, technology and infrastructure, and um, all of those individual um, committees were, were doing presentations. Um, I also sit on LACRA, which is like a legislative oversight of health, uh, human, um, health and human services. <clears throat> and I, those were a presentation um, there with the uh, division of the DHHR. Um, and, and the new secretaries coming in and, and how uh, their organizational charts um, are being developed um, for the new departments. Mm -hmm. So it, anything that you did set up what you're doing, to, uh, talk about in uh, January? Um, yeah, probably not this particular interim. Um, there wasn't a whole lot. A lot of this was just informational. So in, in, um, in finance, uh, you had uh, the the uh, finance people coming in from the governor's office and and telling us you know what the what the different numbers mean and and why um, severance is down and what's up and you know how all these things affect the budget um, for next year so it was more just informational are you concerned about the budget numbers at this time for the first couple of months of this uh, new fiscal year in any way no not after they come in and explain that you know that and and john probably knows this that the, the first couple months of the new um new year the july and august numbers are usually down because you're back paying different things so um you know when they come in and explain a lot of that you you don't have uh as much concern as as i did when i first started seeing the numbers in july and august um and and there's you know the the severance numbers are down but uh, they they took into effect 
or, or into account that they thought the, the severance numbers would be down. So when they, they put the, the budget together, um, they sort of anticipated that. Yeah, yeah. The, you, you never should gauge it on the first couple of months of the year, uh, even the first three. I, I always thought you wait until like the fifth or sixth month, then you got a pretty good idea uh, of how the year is going to go. And in severance in particular, uh, those things go up, down, up, down from sure. month to month. So, yeah. And and there were some surpluses in this particular um, month that they're already seeing surpluses in, in September. So they're anticipating surpluses, but not to the degree that we've had in the past. Um, you know, the, the days of those surpluses well, are probably hope, over. Mike, that means that the governor's office is finally doing a better job of actually estimating rather than intentionally underestimating just to make themselves look good when they beat their breasts and say look at this surplus we got i just think that is uh, we've never had a governor that abused the process as much as this one and in fact I, a whole lot of people i i didn't realize the the uh, opportunity that a governor had to do something like this under the rules under which we operate. Uh, and and I'll agree with you somewhat. He does underestimate to to, to get surpluses, um, but that is also a, a, a result of the flatline budget of, of having a flatline budget year after year after year um, contributed to those surpluses as well, and allowed us to have uh, the large tax but break still, that we did. You, know, you, know, you can have a flatline budget, which you and I would sure. would disagree on. But let's say we do it, you still ought to be able to predict the result of this flatline budget and i contend that the governor's office has been intentionally under underestimating what it's going to be so that they look good when, when the big figures I, come in I, I won't disagree with you john and and i i have said the same thing that a lot of times you know i, I don't know that I, I agree with all this back of the budget type spending mm -hmm. that, that's been going on over the past three or four years but it does make the governor look good and it makes the surpluses look good and and it has afforded us the opportunity to make the cuts that we, we and, like and, to but, have. and west virginia is one of only about a half a dozen states that gives the governor that much leeway to determine just you know what it's going to be without without any uh, uh check from the legislature most of most states the legislature has a role in determining these estimates uh and which which i think is is the way the american system of government is supposed to work well this is a constitutional issue though yes. in west virginia that's so right we would, it, it would have to be a constitutional right. amendment to change it so it's the modern budget amendment of about what 50 60 years ago sure. uh, and prior to that the, the 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 governor had to agree with the other constitutional officers the auditor the treasurer the secretary of state the ag commissioner back then the superintendent of schools was elected all of them got together and agreed on it and again the legislature had no role whatsoever uh and i i just think that uh, the the legislature needs to have uh a a, a role from day one in, in determining what the numbers are supposed to be i, I don't disagree with you hey jeff haddox has asked a question which a lot of us have uh have thought as well mike uh you said this is primarily informational sure why could not the information be uh, presented by zoom meetings as opposed to driving to charleston face to face um well i'm sure some of it could be um but there's there are other things we do down there that's not just informational informational um there are meetings that take place where we're actually voting on stuff this particular interim i don't think we did and and you know, I guess it's in the Constitution as well that we have to meet once a month anyway. So I don't know that, that we have to do by Zoom. I don't think we have to every month, but I, I don't know that you could do everything by Zoom that you really want to do. Um, and, and they're moving things around the state from time to time. So it's not always in Charleston. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. There's a lot going face to face has a lot to do with it. But if it's primarily informational, then zoom lends itself more to that I, i'm glad you yeah. guys have started once again 
having interims in other parts of the state rather than Charleston. Mm -hmm. Uh, For for a long time when I was in, we did that at least twice a year. Uh, And then for some reason, they stopped for about 10 years, I Mm -hmm. think. They didn't have any at all. And and I always thought that would give us, that gave us an opportunity uh, to find out, kind of get a, a more of a feel of the specific problems of a given area. Uh, and uh, oh, I don't know why they stopped doing I it. I absolutely agree with you. That, I think it's it's great that we do that, and it, it does exactly that. It allows the other delegates and senators <clears throat> to get to other places in the state and see the different problems and, mm-hmm. and issues that you have in different areas. Um, we had our, our, our first outside of Charleston interim um, this particular year over in Huntington, and it was on Marshall's campus, and there was a lot of stuff about Marshall and what was going on over there and in the city of Huntington. Um, the next one will be in November. It'll be up in Wheeling, so you'll have all the issues that are going on in the northern panhandle addressed as well. Um, and just last year they had one over in um, in Morgan County. So mm-hmm. you had everybody visiting the eastern panhandle. And then there are trips and stuff set up during those, um, those particular interims where you had uh, legislators that were going to different places in the eastern panhandle and visiting like uh, mm-hmm. P&G or, or things like that. So you, they get a good yeah, taste of side what, trips. That, yes. uh, yeah. <clears throat> so they get a good idea of what's going on in the different areas and which I liked when they came over to, to the eastern panhandle um, and they took them out on those electric buses that we're building here in, in West Virginia and, and they didn't do so well up and down the hills. So, um, so they got a, a, a good look at those. They'll get the technology right. But they also, they also got to go, they because it was in, in Berkeley Springs, they came down Route 9 and they got to see all the issues that we have right. and the traffic issues that we have on Route 9. So I think that was important for all the other legislators to see as well. Mike, during the Amendment 2 debate, the governor made a a very personal between he, Eric Tarr, and Craig Blair. He has weighed in this past week on the transfer rule. Now, you took a position last time on the radio of what a great advocate you were for the transfer rule. Do you think it's going to be personal between you and the governor here? I think Bill's setting you up. I'm trying to, Rob. <laughs> trying to get high yeah. primary. <laughs> By some angry what, parents whose kids lost I, 93 to 6. What I said was we need to look at the transfer rule and whether or not it's being effective. Now, I, I will agree with some of the other people who have said, listen, we need to slow our roll. We need to, this is week one. Okay, and we really need to see in those particular games, was it a factor of the transfer rule? How many kids transferred into that school and were playing on that team as starters that attributed to those high scores? Was it? And you can go back to last year and see scores like that as well before the transfer rule. So is it the transfer rule that is causing this? And if it's not, then we need to, you know, sort of pump our brakes and give the transfer rule time to flush out maybe a a four or five years and say, is it really contributing to these high schools? Mike, I I don't think you've seen that many scores in one week uh, previously. But um, actually, we did last yeah. year. It and was, we had scores like that. And if 90 and 80 to nothing? Yes. Mm-hmm. No? Yes, okay. So All right. And if memory serves, you were last Friday, you said you were a reluctant supporter of this. So you were not, you did not carry the spirit. Bill, Bill no, don't be trying I, to back I, out. I sat up the Badger because you cornered him. You cornered the Badger. Now you're backing away. <laughs> but I, I don't want to embarrass the Badger. No, no, no. I, I was. I was a reluctant supporter of it. I, I, I feel like the, the kids and parents need the freedom to, to move their, their kids around to get the education where they need but th- i was concerned about this rule doing just that that being used for primarily sports reasons and not educational reasons and the purpose for it was for educational reasons and i don't know that that's the way it's being used the majority of the time i had some fear of of these super teams being formed um and I was assured that that wasn't going to happen. So I, I want to give it time to flush out yeah. and make sure that that's – before we go – there's no reason to go back and, and look at it this session. We need some time to look and see if this really have, is affected. So with the governor's comment, he was not targeting you. He was not looking you in the <laughs> eye. You know, there would be a look I, down for the governor. I think Michael Height is the least of the governor's worries. <laughs> hey, Mike, you mentioned DHHR, and I know you serve on that committee uh-huh. there. Yes. Is uh, At this time, 
with the changes that were made and proposed, has there been an appreciable improvement in DHHR that those who use the services regularly would notice? Um, I don't think that the, 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 the individuals that usually use DHR will notice anything different because the, the, um, the separation hasn't fully been implemented. Mm -hmm. it, it, right now, it is still DHHR as a whole. Uh, until and, July 1, until, right? Uh, until Jan 1. Oh, January, January 1. 1. Okay, yeah. Um, and, and that's when it's supposed to go into effect. So right now, they're trying to get the organizational charts and how it's all going to be laid out and, and how they're going to use the, the combined administration um, to, to um, take care of all of them. Um, I don't in sitting in locker I don't think that went well for them um, when they brought out the organizational char, uh, charts and and displayed them to um, the the people on locker and then each individual secretary came in and and tried to justify their organizational chart it didn't go well for any of them I don't think um, that the whole purpose of this was to provide a better product and to make things more streamlined and efficient and this their organizational charts looked very top heavy um and they were sort of admonished um by uh the locker for their organizational charts and and were essentially told uh you need to go back to the drawing board and, and present us with something a whole lot better have all the secretaries been identified have the three new ones plus uh, administrative business? yes they have um and and forgive me for not having their names um <laughs> do they have to be approved uh by or confirmed by the legislators not to my knowledge yeah oh, oh, maybe the secretaries the oh yeah probably the senate they, they have to be appointed by the governor and con with the advice and consent of the senate of the yes. senate yes mm -hmm. And that has not been done at this point in time? Um, not to my knowledge. So they are like interim okay. secretaries. Sort of like, sort of like secretaries in waiting. Yes. But, and I'll tell you, one of, the, one of the issues that I particularly had is, is you had the facilities, the Secretary of Facilities, um, which they've separated out, and it's mm -hmm. just the hospitals that, that are run by the state. Um, and the org chart came down, and it was the secretary, and then the secretary had a COO, and then on the other side below him had a a strategist and then below them had the the ceos of each hospital and you know i sort of admonished him i said you know it seems to me like as the secretary you should be more hands-on mm -hmm. and you should be the coo right. and you should be the strategist i agree and the secretary why do i need three people to do this at at who knows how much money we're paying these individuals um, to do the same job that I would think the secretary should be doing all three of those jobs. We're running out of time before 1 January, uh, and you admonished them. Do you think there'll be a rework, a rewiring of the diagram? Um, I, I do. I think there'll be some a rework of it. And, um, you know, we are running out of time, but we still have three more months to, to come back and, and for them to, to reorg uh, things and, and possibly give us a, a a separate way of uh, of doing them um, doing the org charts Mike I realize nothing is prepared overnight uh, but the decision to split DHHR into three groups the three distinct groups was done, was made over a year or so ago mm -hmm. why are we so slow and not you but the organization why are we so slow in putting these steps into place now and with the uh, uh, and the admonishment, the rewiring, whatever the case may be, it's going to be more and more cramped. I'm just I'm a little surprised and disappointed. The bureaucracy, the complex, the complexity of the bureaucracy, but, but bureaucracy because Bill, it's taking so long. You know, the the legislature gave him that much time, because the governor wanted that much time. I think so he could keep his people in longer. Well, That's just my opinion. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> let me ask. Let me. I, ask, I, I, don't, know. I don't know. I, 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 that may be part of it, but yeah. I think the, the legislature thought this was going to take time, and okay. and, the, and this was a this was one of the biggest departments we have in the state of West Virginia, and to separate it out into three um, was going to take some time, and it was going to take some some thought and a lot of meetings and and so on and so forth. How were you going to separate out and which divisions or which you know minor departments were 
were going to go to which secretary. So um, I, I thought that was I, th- I thought the easy part was going to be facilities. Obviously, you, mm-hmm. you, you move facilities right away, but then the, the health and human services um, section of it. How do you separate those out, and which you know? responsibilities go under which who's in charge of facilities who's going to be doing the administrative part uh again uh, dr caruso maybe i think maybe his name um it's a gentleman um the the other two positions um one is um secretary priscilla um and I don't remember her first name. And Sounds then, like good Italian folks. Yeah, uh, <laughs> and then Dr. Young, I think, was the third. He doesn't sound Italian at all. <laughs> no. No, no, no. She. Oh, she. she. Yeah, she. So uh, in regards to foster care and such, a couple of years ago, this became a headline in the state with the issues with foster care. I've not heard much about foster care at all over the last six months or so. Does that mean things have improved, or have we just stopped noting the problems? Um, I don't. I don't know things that have improved greatly, um, but we are still talking about it. it. It is still a topic of conversation, and and one that I think we're going to try to tackle in this next session. Um, but it is sort of under DHHR, so uh, again, they're in the middle of that rework. Um, but I think there are people. There are individuals, at least within the House of Delegates, who are foster parents. And I can tell you right now, they they keep it at the forefront and at the top of the list on a constant basis. So it is not something that is forgotten. Who will be responsible for writing any legislation that improves DHHR? Is that something DHHR will craft and send to you folks to be perfected? Or is that something you come up with yourselves based on the problems they have? Usually we, we... crafted ourselves that there are a lot of um a lot of health care uh, individuals within um the health committee um so a lot of the legislation that gets crafted is crafted by them um and and the lawyers within the health uh, committee and it, a lot of it is because of what they see when they're working in this field um and and how things could be improved so a lot of the legislation legislation comes from them Along the same line, Mike, uh, with the split up into three different groups, will all three report to the same legislative committee? And I'm saying that because one of the real problems in the federal government, if there was a reorganization, frequently the reason it is not done uh, correctly is that the uh, the oversight committee and either the Senate or the House one do not want to give up any of their jurisdiction. So they try to hold on to portions of it. So I think the the health committee will still oversee all, all yeah. three. Okay. The only separation that I see coming out of DHHR possibly is um, OFLAC, which is a, an oversight um, group within the health. Um, and there's some discussion to try to to try to push that over um, to the Office of Inspector General. Um, that they, they don't like the the fact that OFLAC, who investigates you know wrong doings in in the health organization, being under a secretary that they're investigating. Um, that there could be you know if you if you report to a certain secretary and there's some wrongdoing in there, you may want to just keep things quiet and and try to sweep it under the rug and that's a concern and and some of the concerns that may have happened in the past so they're trying to get that over into the office of inspector general and and in the case of the of the the legislative committees in in both houses i think it's called the the committee on health and human resources so that would still cover each of those three three departments and and the accountability one that you're on lacra legislative oversight committee on health and human resources accountability Correct. Again, uh, it's it, it it covers all three areas. The Correct. Inspector General, do they report to the governor or to the legislature? Um, to the governor, um, and I think that's newly formed. I, I believe there's, it is. There's yeah. A, yeah. a position, and um, actually, one of our delegates just uh, resigned to take over that position, Mike Honecker, and uh, brilliant guy, really, really good legislator. Uh, sorry to see him leave, but um, uh, definitely. Uh, it, somebody that that should have been elevated to that position he'll do a good job is he a numbers man good is he a numbers man 
Um, he, he's a numbers man. He's organized. Um, he comes from a law enforcement background, so um, uh, he was a state police officer. <clears throat> and uh, the state police office and all their issues and problems right now um, will fall under that. that Very area. level-headed person. <clears throat> oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, really good guy. Larry, Delegate Larry Cump's wife, Cheryl, just texted me and said, Foster care is currently putting children in hotels unsupervised. I personally know kids that are there. Uh, I, I don't know the full extent of what that means in terms of unsupervised, what hotels or what towns, but that's what uh, Delegate Cump's wife, Cheryl, just texted me and said. I hope that's not the case, but... Uh, I'm not going to debate. I really don't know. <laughs> yeah, I said, does Larry know? And she said, yes. So maybe that's something to look well, into right now. If, if Larry's involved, I'm sure Le Larry <laughs> doesn't shy away from controversy. So he'll, <laughs> he'll jump right in um, and, and try to address it. Mike, thanks for coming in. We'll see you again on Friday. Thank you. Delegate Mike Hyde at 9.01. This is Talk Radio WNR Martinsburg and TV.